Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And I have to be transparent. I, I had to get courage. It took me a year to ask Quint to be on the show. So, Quint Studer, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Deb. I'm, I'm glad you got the courage up. Thank I you. I got the courage. I, I You know, coming from the healthcare medical world, you just have so much richness and expertise to share. And, and I know you're a busy guy. We've rescheduled. So, I've put some great leadership questions together for you. And then we're going to have fun with some Fab Four questions at the end. But I'm ready to dig in if you're ready. That'd be fine. Go right ahead. Okay, here's my first leadership question. What strategies have you implemented to foster a culture of continuous improvement and innovation within your healthcare organizations or perhaps one that you've worked with as a client and I'm asking you this particularly in light of the evolving landscape that we've seen since COVID in terms of healthcare delivery, but also technology. I would love any kind of overview and, and insight that you could share in that regard. Sure. So thank you. Um, I, I think what I did with this, well, first of all, I'm naturally curious. So I think curiosity plays a handle in, in my own personality. It can drive people. I call it curiosity. My wife calls it quirkiness, um, wanting to know how things work and how this happens and how do you take us. I say, if you ever want to have process improvement, ask a guy because we're lazy. We're always looking for shortcuts <laughs> anyway. And, and so I think I'm curious, but I think what I've really done differently since COVID is take um, precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how precision medicine has evolved from, you know, there used to be evidence-based medicine, which it still is. And I then got into evidence-based leadership. So when I became knowledgeable on precision medicine, I said, is that an approach we should use for development? And the, the, which is usually individualized, N equals one. And it's usually you start with an assessment. And I think because we want to have solutions, it's so easy, not easy, but it just, we go to the next book, the last article the next shiny object. And some of mine are those things, but I still tell people don't implement these things till you do a good assessment. So right. where we've developed internally and helped other organizations is say, if someone is in leadership, remember probably 30 to 50% of people in a leadership position today in healthcare came after March of 2020. And they're probably leading people that's the same ratio. So we have a lot of inexperienced people. So this going back to basics is a fallacy because they weren't here and basics yes. of shit. Yeah. So I think we use precision medicine. We try to say, you know, what are the skills a person needs for this job? And then we check the self-awareness because I think leadership development or any development starts with, am I aware? And we have them on a one through 10 evaluate their skill set on what they feel and their boss feels is important on the job. Then the supervisor also sort of gives their feedback and then we do a gap analysis. And sometimes there's close, sometimes there's a, a gap, which brings clarity to development. And then we try to prioritize because even though somebody might have a low skill set in an area, maybe it's because they don't need it that much. So let's not do Buffalo herd training where everybody goes into the, gets the same thing. And then we also really like to look at different assessment tools. Like how does a person think? You know, where's their behavioral you know, where do they want to go? Are they pace-oriented, structure? Do they have a Jahari window? Because we really work on this whole self-awareness. And then there's some other work you can do on critical thinking skills. So we sort of want to do a good diagnosis of the leader, tell the leader we're investing in their skill development. 92% of leaders want skill development, but don't think they get it. Yes. And we don't call it training. We call investing in skill development today. And then we call what we, we create an individualized development plan within what we call an OSAR. What's the outcome we want? What's the skill set we want to work on? What's the actions we're going to take and what the resources? Immediately when we do that, Deb, the manager anxiety goes way down because yeah. we're not overwhelming them. We call it one skill at a time. So I think that's the big change we've made is really rewiring, rewiring how we develop um, individuals. You know, and it's so interesting. If we think about the academic world, there's always an individual education plan. When you think about a medical world, and I come from the rehab, 
we always do an individual treatment plan. And I love that you've, you have the individual approach. And I love that there's not just one assessment because there's never a one size fits all. And I love the OSAR uh, in terms of looking at that model and renaming the training so that people don't think, you know, they're trying to fix me or trying to make me be something I'm not. So that's so interesting. And I love the precision medicine. That's that's a new term that I've not heard. So I like that. Thank you. So the second question, Quint has permanent residency on the show. And I've asked over 270 leaders this question. What imperfections does Quint bring to his heart-centered leadership? Um, lack of patience. Uh, I, I find that I have way too much urgency. And if I was a football play, quarterback, I'd be terrible because I throw too fast. You know, you know, if you look at great quarterbacks, they let the play evolve right. and it's timing. So I, I think it's always been impatience and a complete lack of how long something should take. I remember calling a person that we hired one day and he'd been there and I, I was a little frustrated. He hadn't done much. I called him up. I said, you know, You've been with us for a while. I really need more out of you. He said, I've only been here 90 days. I said, you're kidding. That's all. I said, never mind. Forget this phone call. I'll call you later. <laughs> so it, it's that not, it's sort of like uh, Stephen Covey helped me a lot on this with his seven essential habits is think at the end in mind and work your way backwards on how long things are really going to take. So I, I think it's really a, a lack of understanding how long things will take and think assuming things can happen a lot quicker than they can. I, I think it's a quality that has been named probably the most from this question. So you're in good company. And I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes our our fuel, our, our passion gets so fueled that it kind of fosters that impatience because we want to get to the end when really, like you said, we need to start with the end and, and work our way back. So that's uh, that's a great answer. Okay, my third question. In navigating the complexities of healthcare policy and regulation, how do you prioritize maintaining ethical standards and patient-centered care, but at the same time ensuring operational efficiency and financial sustainability? Because it seems like we've been in a bit of a juggle as we navigated the pandemic, and I'd, I'd love to get kind of your vantage point of where we've landed in regards to this question. Well, I think it all goes together. And I think sometimes in healthcare, one of the challenges with some leaders is they don't truly understand cause and effect. Mm. So I, I think they all go together. So I, I think, for example, if you have lower turnover, which means better retention, you'll have a, a shorter length of stay. Mm-hmm. Now, I also can show research that shows you'll have better clinical outcomes. Now, if you have a shorter length of stay, that means you'll have better access into care. So if you have more access into care, that means you'll treat more people. And if you have lower turnover, that means you have a more experienced staff. So you'll have less falls, less errors. So I think it all fits together. I think sometimes we just don't understand cause and effect. And my cause and effect story was when I first got to or be a president of a hospital, they had a, a dedicated IV start team. And they decided at budget crunch time to re, to eliminate that and just said, you know, the nurses can start these IVs. We'll just train them. Well, the problem is we, they, the, I walked in, they just got rid of the IV team. And, and now it looked great on paper because we saved all this money for, re, for eliminating these IV start nurses and put them into staffing. Now, But we had another item that went way up, and that was infections. But see, we didn't, you have to connect the two dots. And here's a dot today for for your listeners. We just did a big study on nursing. And we found that there's so many new nurses that the charge nurse is a lifeline to them. This charge nurse is key to their staying on the job, feeling trained, and being retained. But about 90% of the hospitals, in order to reduce the cost of travel nurses, have put their charge nurses in staffing. So mm-hmm. while it looks good on this one you know, line item, mm-hmm. reduce travel nurses, I believe we're going to pay the price with falls, infections, and turnover. So it's really being able to, I think, truly understand the cause and effect and not think in, in just sort of silos. 
You know, it's similar to what you said with the uh, first question in that it's almost like looking out. It can it can make that the metrics on the spreadsheet look good and balance the budget. But then when you come out to look at the actual realization and the action that falls back on that nurse and the responsibility, you don't see the outcome, like you said. So it's interesting how the, the questions can be so similar. It's interesting how metrics can take over sometimes, isn't it? Oh, I think metrics are fine. I believe if you do these approaches, you'll have better financial results, mm -hmm. not worse financial results. I, I interviewed a person for my podcast um, the other day um, from a great hospital, and he's invested quite heavily in some areas, but he's got great financial return, but you got to let the play evolve, which right. means it'll take a while for the retention to yeah. pick. It's not going to right. Or if we cut an expense, it can happen minimally that day. It can happen very quickly. Right. I think you have to be a little patient to let these things, as I say, the play unfold till yeah. you start getting results. But then when you do get the results, they're sustainable. And then those results keep compounding on each other. Absolutely. There's a lot of play here going on, a lot of playbook talk. And it's interesting that we're so close to the Super Bowl. Are you a football fan? Well, I'm a Swifty, so uh, <laughs> I'm so duly, I'm at, duly noted. I'm 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 paying more attention this year than I have in a long, long time. Yeah, there's some nice there's some nice uh, co-branding going on there with the NFL. It's kind of fun to see, and I think she's fabulous, by the way. Okay, here's my last question for leadership. Could you share with our listeners a significant challenge that you have faced as a healthcare leader? And perhaps a lesson learned or one that you overcame. And then additionally, the second part of the question is, do you believe that your leadership approach contributed to addressing and resolving the challenge effectively? Yes. And I will tell you, I'll give you two examples okay. and how I learned. When I was at Holy Cross Hospital as the chief operating officer, we were at such a bad payer mix that we couldn't get doctors to cover unless we subsidized them. So we were subsidizing our neonatologists quite heavily because about 30% of our babies were born um, adversely affected by substances. Okay. So we paid the, the neonatologist to come to our hospital and, and we had to because we had to take care of the patient, but it was a heavy cost. Mm -hmm. Well, as, our, as we got better, you know, all of a sudden we became the turnaround hospital of the year. Fortune Magazine did a story on us. We all of a sudden got where we maybe didn't have to subsidize these stocks as much. So I was in charge of doing an RFP for, as their contract ran out. And I was pretty excited because I got an offer from another group that came in and I could have saved the hospital maybe $150,000. And this was like 1995 or so. So that was pretty hefty. And I went in to see our, my CEO, Mark Clement, who's one of the most value-based people I've ever met. And I was told him and he said, you know, I, we can't do that. He said, you know, this group was with us this, when we couldn't find anyone else. Mm -hmm. And we can't now, just because we don't need them, toss them out. And I saw how value-led leadership worked. So now I'm president of Baptist Hospital. Um, our emergency room was like the first percentile in patient experience. Um, and our, our contract was coming up. We talked to the physicians and we really... Um, you know, tried to put patient experience into their contract. And they really balked. And, you know, we had a hospital that was maybe some people consider not in the greatest location. And they were very politically smart, um, the, this physician group with people in the community and uh, so on. And um, they came back to me and they said, we'd only agree if we were within two standard deviations of the norm, which meant they could be in the ninth percentile. So then they said to me, now, if you think you can do better, you're welcome to interview other groups. So I interviewed another group. The group came on campus, they found out, and I got a call from the chair, the president of the health, health system, because I was not as a health system, as a hospital. And he called me and asked me how negotiations were going to the emergency room physicians. I said, they're a little testy. He said, they must be, they just all resigned. So I had a whole entire ER group resign at that moment. Wow. 90 days notice. And I think the reason they didn't tell me they were resigning because they told corporate 
because the feeling was, because they're pol very politically smart, that corporate would come back to me and say, you got to give into these because we have no choice. We're going to be in a mess. To the corporate's credit, they backed me. And so um, they left, but they had 90 days notice. So I had to go through them coming to the executive medical staff, asking for a no confidence vote, which they, which they did get. I was even surprised, um, you know, and then they had for every month, we had a monthly medicine physician meeting. They would get up and talk about how bad I was. Uh, they did had a press conference and told they had to leave uh, their loyalty because of this new administrator, blah, blah, blah. And um, it was really difficult. And, and I sat there at these meetings and I sort of wanted to give in because it would have been so much easier. But I couldn't because I looked at what's right for the patients. And, um, and, and so we, we didn't give in. We went through a pretty rough first year, but we ended up with patient experience way higher. We ended up seeing a lot more people. But that's, again, when I thought back to what, what do I lead with, values or comfort? And I think sometimes we, we have to be able to go through discomfort in leadership. So oh, that was absolutely. a tough time to, yeah. to go through that. But it's a great thing. story, though. What, what, what do you think was your biggest takeaway for yourself personally outside I, of your leadership? Uh, I've never been, I, I think at the time, I, I could act like I was courageous, but I'm not sure I was. I think, you know, remember, I always was a COO, so I could talk tough while the CEO had to actually do the deal. Right. The first time as a president of a hospital that the buck stopped with me. Right. And I thought, I, I don't know if I would have made that decision five years earlier or eight years earlier, because I don't think I had the courage. Right. But two things increased. My sets of values, by watching Mark Clement handle the neonatologist, and the courage the courage to, because I thought it was the right thing to do. Well, and that's why I started this podcast because people look at all levels of leaders, especially, you know, on an executive team or in the C-suite, and they always have, you know, a mis, uh, misconception that you guys got it all figured out and you're allowed to be imperfect at the end of the day. You're allowed to have fear and not have courage. And it just brings... It just brings the show to a realness that it doesn't really matter what sector we're in. We're all in the people business and we have feelings and thoughts, emotions, and even C-suites don't have it together on most days. And, and that's okay. We're, we're allowed to be imperfect. I think there's a bigger challenge right now though. Well, I have a new book coming out with Catherine Meese on the human margin, building trust. And if you look at research, trust is pretty low right now it in is. leadership. My organization supports me and they care about my, they care about my well-being. And a big part of that, I think, is just the fact of COVID. It made leaders less visible. You had issues over vaccinations, visiting yeah. hours, supply chain, town halls got canceled, development got canceled. So we're sort of digging out of a bit of, bit of a hole. But I am a huge believer that sometimes God comes through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I think there's too many executives that are afraid to show their vulnerability. I remember, um, again, being in a presentation, the CEO of the system got up and talked and you could tell he was off. And almost at break, people are saying, what's going on? Is there a reduction in force coming? Something's happening. And I knew him well enough to ask him. And he said, well, yesterday my wife got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you might want to get up and sort of not, you know, I understand you might not want to break her stuff, but people probably know anyway. He got up and sort of shared what was going on in his life and it changed the whole conversation. You know, I, I'm very open about him, uh, a recovering alcoholic in my 41st year of sobriety now. And um, I find, you know, there's times when it might hurt you, but you know, you help a lot of people. And I, I've been so sad. I've, I've seen senior executives, Deb, not share stuff and I wish they would and finish with this real life story. Talking to a CEO, female CEO, you know, knew her and talked to her in a while and um, asked her, I always asked about her family because she always talked about her kids and that. And she said, well, I'm, I'm going through a divorce. I said, oh, that, that's too bad. I said, um, what's, what's, you know, how's it going at work? She said, well, they don't know. Now, this has been going on for a year. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you mean they don't know? I don't want to tell them. Now, this means for a year she's been acting like, Things are fine. They'll ask about her husband. I, 
And I really encouraged her because you're only as sick as your secrets. Mm-hmm. That you got to lay these things out and you'll find people, people get it. I, um, I said last story, one more, uh, a nurse, if you create the right safe environment, and, and we were writing the book on trust, you hear all these stories. And um, so a nurse was really struggling with her adolescent daughter, very serious behavioral issues. And it was her, of course, impacting her work. Mm-hmm. So she finally got enough pain that she went to tell her manager what was going on. Her manager then explained to her what she had gone on with her own teenage daughter, which was very, very similar. And they ended up both crying. And the nurse manager was able to help the nurse seek out some help that was available at the hospital. See, that would not have happened if that manager had not created a safe environment that that nurse felt comfortable sharing it. You know, I I volunteered for seven years in our city at the local hospice. And I think what drew me there was just losing so many members of my family. And I think I kind of healed along the way with the people I met in the hallway losing their loved ones. But the serendipitous moment for me was when my dad passed away, I was 21, he had a heart attack, and his cardiologist landed up being in our hospice, and I recognized his name, and he remembered my dad, and he remembered me as a young girl. And what a what a beautiful, meaningful conversation we had, uh, right down to the point where he said, you know, you've got to get me a dress shirt and a tie and my wife's coming for lunch and and you got to get me looking good. And it was just such a deep, connected conversation. And it took me back to, you know, how many years ago in my 20s? I'm not going to tell you because it was a long time ago. And just to know that he remembered me. You think of how many patients he would have seen in decades of his, you know, uh, practice. And he remembered me and he remembered me coming to see my dad right when he passed away. And I just find all those little moments in life when we can let our guard down and we can allow our realness and vulnerability to come. Those are the serendipitous moments that I think open the bandwidth to connection with each other. And I think most physicians don't get the empathy because they're another group that has to act like they're tough and you. I tell people when you look at healthcare, if you had if you were in a business and you had somebody pass away, you would shut down the business. You'd bring in guide crisis counselors for your employees. Yeah. Healthcare does that every day. You know, yeah. when when my first grandchild was a stillborn birth, mm. that OBGYN and the staff went through watching a mother have deliver a full term baby, thinking it was going to be alive, and at the last minute things didn't work out. They had to walk out of that row and they didn't have a decompression time. No. They walked right into a row and had to now, good news, deliver a baby that was fine. But I think the range of emotions healthcare people go through oh. are incredible. And I think empathy, that's the other thing I think I've had to develop better over the years is being more empathetic on what people go through. Absolutely. And, and you know, I have nieces that are nurses and I've watched them navigate the last four years and it's been tough. And it's like you said, it's, you know, it's kind of like not to compare, but the similarities to a first responder, you know, yep. you're, you're a 911 operator. You don't know the outcome. You just, yep. you're on the front end and how do they decompress? They have the hardest position within a police service. So it's like you said, they don't decompress because they've got to go on to the next room, to the next patient, to the next treatment. And um, that's such a great point. Okay, I'm going to switch to my Fab Four because we want to get a feeling for who Quint is as a person outside of his fabulous leadership and entrepreneurship. Name a word or phrase that shows up daily in your leadership language. Gratitude. Oh, I love that. That's a great word. And verb and action. Name a book that you have read. And just to give a little bit of context, this can be at any time in your life. What's the name of the book and the author and why was it impactful to you? In Search of Excellence. And Tom Peters was one of the authors and I was a new supervisor. I was completely convinced I didn't know how to do this. I didn't want to tell my boss I was 
didn't know how to do it. So I went to the local Hegberg Library in Janesville, Wisconsin. And um, I didn't even know how to do this stuff. I mean, there was not, you know, bookstores like there are now or online. And, and they had uh, the book In Search of Excellence. And then they had a small, like, film. You know, back then it was like a film that you could watch of Tom Peters explaining In Search of Excellence. And he made it sound doable. Mm. He made it sound, I call it bite size. So I watched that and I felt, you know, I, I think I can do some of this. And until then, I just think I can't do this. So I think In Search of Excellence by Tom Peters was a, a real change book for me. And probably the next book as my career evolved was Seven Essential Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Yeah, I thought that's a great that, that really helped me. And I got to give you one more. It's The Four Agreements by Ruiz yes. that helped me tremendously with, you know, don't take things personally yes. as she can. So those are three books that I think really have been beneficial to me. I love that. Okay, the next question's kind of fun, and I'm really excited to hear your answer. So I'm going to grant you a wish. Mm -hmm. And you get to have dinner with any leader of your choice. Now, this leader may be living or maybe they've passed away. Who are you having dinner with and what is the dinner conversation? I'm having dinner with my grandfather, oh, L.L. Okay. Studer. In fact, I have his name thing right here. Oh, on your dad. He died, he died when I was 16, but he was um, with the Missouri Pacific Railroad. He had a pretty good job and he was also mayor of Sedalia, Missouri. And I think he, he was a... I would have liked to learn more about him and, and just in general, because I, um, yeah, I think he did some neat stuff. But he was, when he was mayor of Sedalia, I remember this was 19, early 60s, um, he wanted to give the sanitation workers a pay raise. Now, at the time, all the sanitation workers were black and the city council pushed back on him because in order to give them the pay raise, he wanted Garbage collection always been free. And so he, he needed a charge for garbage collection. So you can imagine the community went, you know, upset. We're gonna, you're gonna pay us more and blah, blah, blah. So the city council blocked him. So he quit. And 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 the headline of the Sedalia Democrat said, LL Studer resigns as mayor. A week later it says LL Studer's back. Because basically he threw the gauntlet down. And when he passed away, the thing my grandmother felt best about is the diversity, racially diversity of people that showed up at his funeral. So I would have loved to have talked to him. And he was also there because my uncle was the mayor before him, was when they took and integrated and closed down the black hospital to integrate it into the hospital. So they were, to, and they got ahead of the game. They got ahead of the game because this was in the 50s with integration and um, of the hospital and the school district. And I don't think they had some of the issues that other people had in the 60s. But I just love the fact that he went to the mat for the, for the sanitation workers. I love that. I, I think there's leadership in your DNA from the sounds of it. Would you agree? I think so. No, I think I think most leaders have a DNA. Um, might not call leadership, but they call one to be useful. They call Absolutely. One to be, I think most leaders... The DNA is they want to be useful and helpful to other people. Well, before we close out the show, I want to let our listeners know that we will put all your contact details and your full bio below. And when is the date of your new book coming out? Um, March. They can order it if, if this. Okay. Well, we will make sure we have the link and um, I order think on Amazon. It's on trust. And I think well, and I was just going to say, I, I don't think you could have picked a better time to write a book on trust. And I'm going to agree with you that I think on a global level, it's one of the biggest things we're seeing, not just in healthcare in many sectors. I think it's I think it's residual from COVID and some of the great examples that you mentioned. And uh, I think I might have to get myself a copy and read that. Well, that's, you know, that's think of physicians, you know, what people want to know is they can trust who's taking care of them. They can Absolutely. trust where they're at. They can trust Absolutely. what they're hearing. Yeah. Uh, employees, the same thing. And yeah. you know, that's why, again, during COVID particularly, we've realized that uh, trust is low and, and it's low. And if people, I want people to feel good about their senior leadership. I want people to feel good about the organization they work in because they work too hard 
not feel joyful. Absolutely. With what- Absolutely. Um, you have been delightful. This has completely exceeded my expectations. And I just want to thank you for your leadership. I look up to you very much. And I was delight- delighted that you were able to put me into your schedule, which I know is busy. So thank you to your great assistant, Barbara, for finally getting us together. And I'm going to ask you to finish this sentence and we will close out the show. Heart-centered leadership is? Love.